Tonight's lesson, four letter words. Let me uh, read you a little story here very quickly. The story is told of an Egyptian ruler named Amasis who sent a sacrificial animal to the residence of a rest, uh, respected sage. And his request of the wise man was that he send back the best part and the worst part of this animal to his sovereign. To the surprise of the monarch, not two parts, but one was returned to him. The tongue was sent back as that which is both best and worst in a living thing. Best and worst in a living thing. Another story that I'm reminded of <clears throat> uh, that is uh, germane to the topic of uh, my lesson tonight uh, many years ago in Montreal, in the subway, you know, in the subway stations there, um, the subway agency had an ad campaign. And that ad campaign had as its goal the encouragement of people to use better language. And the slogan was, all these ads, these billboards inside the subway, the slogan was, to speak well is to respect yourself. To speak well is to respect yourself. Imagine a, a public, a municipal agency having a, a, an ad campaign, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to encourage its writers to use good language and not to use profanity. You see, even in a non-religious context, people have always understood the power of the tongue and that its improper use was always destructive. So in my lesson tonight, um, I'd like to focus in on one specific sin of the tongue, and that is swearing. I want to talk about swearing tonight. Now there are different types of swearing. For example, there is swearing as in taking an oath. You know, the oath of citizenship. When I became an American citizen, I took an oath of citizenship. Uh, an oath between two people, for example, in the Bible, Abimelech swears not to harm Abraham, uh, makes an oath, he swears, Genesis 2, 22 to 24. Jesus, of course, said to use these things lightly, let your yes be yes and your no be no, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. So there's that kind of swearing. And then there is swearing as in the use of profanity. This is the swearing that I'm referring to, using words of a sacred nature irreverently, using God's name or the, the name of religious things or sacred ideas and so on and so forth, or using coarse language or vulgar ideas. You ever wonder why, why, do, people, why do people do this? You know, swearing in public and swearing in the media, you know, movies and things like that, is common now, right? We, we, we see a great movie, it sounds like an interesting idea, and then you look at the rating. G, PG, PG-13, R, what's the other one? N-17, and then they describe it. Profanity, constant graphic profanity. I mean, that's like saying to me, okay, you're not going to see this movie. <laughs> Warns you off, doesn't it? But do you know that as recently as 1939, not that long ago, you were not allowed to swear in a movie. You were not allowed to say the word damn even in a movie. The very first movie that used a word, a swear word was, everybody? Gone with the wind. Yes, gone with the wind. We thought, well, no big deal. You know, what's the deal? Everybody says that. You know, people say that all the time, you know, let's make the movie real. What could be the harm? <laughs> what could be the harm? If we open that door just a crack, what could be the harm? Oh, look what we have today, the music, oh my, TV. Now the rise of this type of behavior is a sign of social anger and frustration in people and a general selfish attitude of the 70s and the 80s, you know. Swearing is the ultimate sign of contempt for someone else. 
When you swear at someone else, I mean, you are, it's utterly contemptible. You, you, you are expressing your contempt for that person, I mean, short of striking them with your fist, swearing at them, uh, is as aggressive as you can become. Psychologists tell us that swearing or cursing is a sign of personal insecurity. It's a way of calling attention to ourselves. Many times a self that we don't like very much to begin with. You know, it's evident in a lot of the music, a lot of the rap music that came out in other music. It's angry nature, violent nature, using curse words. Those are people in lyrics that don't like themselves and don't like the society a whole lot. In many of us, it is a warning that we lack self-control. It isn't the swearing that's the problem, it's the fact that we don't, you know, we're slipping in our ability to control ourselves and the swearing is the kind of the red flag that's going up. You know, most of us swear when we are angry, but some of us get angry for no reason at all. Our problem isn't swearing, our problem is controlling our temper. Now, although there's a lot of bad language in our society, it's, it's not a new problem. I'm not saying this is something that just has happened all of a sudden. I mean, it's, it's not new. Both the Old Testament and of course Jesus talked about it, as did His apostles. You know, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, brief passage, it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The need to protect the integrity of God's name. His name represents his essence and to defile it is sinful. Now if you go to Matthew uh, chapter 12, verses 34 and 37, you read a little bit about what Jesus says concerning these things. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying that what comes out of your mouth is an indication of what's inside of you. Liars speak lies. Impure people speak impurities. Haters of God swear. And good men and women speak truth in clean and encouraging words. You know, I said the other day in another lesson, you, know, you want to judge a religion? You know, judge it by its fruit. That's what Jesus said. You know, judge the tree by its fruit. You want to judge a person? Well, judge by what comes out of their, out of their mouths. You know, I hear people sometimes, you know, they swear, they're vulgar, they're mean, they're always angry and this and that. And then another person, their spouse or their friend, are going to say, yeah, I know on the outside, all of that is on the outside. But down deep inside, he's really a good person. No, he's not. No, he's not. If he's angry and violent and vicious and coarse, if that's what's coming out of his mouth, that's what's inside of him. You know, Jesus said, everything you've said, everything you've said will be known and judged by God. Why do you think we confess Christ openly before baptism? Think about what we do in baptism and what this passage says right here. Why do you think we confess Christ before baptism? God will judge you based on that confession of faith. Do you ever think about that? Only this will be revealed about you. Only that, that you confessed Christ, that's going to be revealed about you because the rest has been forgiven, because the rest has been 
covered over. Let's go to another passage, Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter four, if you have your Bibles. Ephesians chapter four, verse uh, 29. Paul writes, again, very clear terms. Nothing here that you need to, you know, a doctorate in Greek you know, to figure out. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So what is Paul saying? Pretty clear, right? Don't allow useless words to come out of your mouth, swearing, cursing, gossip, lies, slander, mockery. These things have no value. That's the point. They don't have any value. They produce nothing positive and so should not be uttered. On the contrary, the words you utter should have value. You know they have value because at the moment you say them, they build up the people that you are with. The things that come out of your mouth build up the people that are around you. And in verse 30 he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do you notice that these two verses are together? One having something to do with the other? Verse 30 indicates that worthless speech grieves or makes sorrowful the Spirit of God that lives within each Christian. Useless speech, which is what swearing is, essentially has a destructive effect on everybody. On yourself first, because you destroy your own self-respect, it has a negative effect on others because you hold them in contempt. Even if you're not swearing at them, if you're cursing and swearing and gossiping, you must not think a whole lot of the person that's with you. To allow that person to witness what is actually coming out of your mouth. And of course, Paul says, even the Holy Spirit within you the holiness of God that dwells in you is grieved. Rather, we should show who we really are with our speech, building others up, revealing and not hiding the Spirit of God within you by the things that come out of our mouths. Let's read another passage in James this time, chapter three, verse two to six. James says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue, is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and it is set on fire by hell. So James speaks, you know, uh, uh, contributes rather, a considerable portion of his writing, very short epistle, to the tongue and the problems of the tongue. In verse two, he says, everybody sins with the tongue. It's a common and deadly sin. I sin with the tongue, you sin with the tongue. We all know this, it's not a surprise. And then in verses three to five, he gives examples of how small things can affect great things. You know, the small bit in a big horse's mouth controls that large animal, a small rudder controlling a huge ship, forest fires that are begun just with a spark. And ourselves, our entire lives can be ruined just by words that come out of our mouths. So you know, I lay before you the problem, the problem of what is coming out of our mouth. 
disrespecting ourselves, disrespecting others, denying our witness of faith, and even grieving the Spirit of God. That's the, that's the problem. But what's the solution? Well, the solution is in James as well. He gives the problem, but he also provides for a solution. So we continue reading in verse seven. He says, for every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed uh, by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. So James is saying that bad language of all types exists in the world and we hear it all the time. The solution is for us not to add to it ourselves. We need to learn to control our tongues. You see, I can't control the tongue of another, but I can certainly work in controlling my own tongue. In verse seven to 12, James tells us, we have the choice of blessing or cursing, but only one instrument with which to do it, which is the tongue. We've only got the same tool to do both things. So we need to learn to do one consistently because we cannot do both and be pleasing to God. Continuous, continuously producing fresh water from our fountains is difficult, but it is possible if we learn to do the following. First of all, let's start with controlling our tempers, shall we? Let's start there. We need to find acceptable ways of expressing our passionate feelings. We need to find ways to dissipate negative energy caused by frustration and adversity instead of violent outbursts that include swearing. See what I'm saying? The, the way to start getting a handle on the swearing thing is to get a handle on the anger thing, is to get a handle on the temper thing, is to get the handle on the passion thing. So how do, we, how do we deal with that? How do we dissipate a lot of the negative energy that we have? Well, we can pray, <laughs> the month of prayer. <laughs> we can cry. We can call out to God. We can sing. We can run, we can exercise, we can take a shower, we can talk it out. You know, it's okay to express negative feelings and doing it and do it in a positive way. So that's one thing we can do to get a hold of the swearing thing. Let's start getting a hold of the anger thing. Secondly, we can change our habits, can't we? We need to con consciously change our habits of speech and eliminate vocabulary which is vulgar and disrespectful. I remember once uh, Lisa and I were driving in Vermont. I don't know why we were there, maybe I went there to preach. I think there was this little church out there I used to go there and preach. But anyways, I'm having trouble with my car on the way back. You know, something was going wrong. There was a little gas station, you know, just a small gas station by the side of the road, mom and pop shop you know, type thing. Pull the car in there, talking to the mechanic about my car. It's a, it's a, Sunday afternoon, sunny, nice day out. I just go in, I, maybe I'm overheating something. This guy used the F word as a verb, as an adjective, as an adverb, as a noun, as a prepositional phrase. He wasn't angry. He wasn't mad. He thought he was giving me good service. He just had a habit of interjecting this word around every other word that he, that he used. He needed a change of habit. We also need to change our habits you know, with uh, sexual or bathroom vocabulary. You know, it's expected maybe of curious adolescents, but not of grown men and women. And the tough one, here's the tough one really, 
euphemisms. Do we know what euphemisms are? The substitution of a word or a phrase for a less objectionable word or phrase. For example, what is a euphemism? I'll give you a couple of examples. G, that's a euphemism, G. A euphemistic contraction of the name of Jesus. Now somebody says, oh, I say G, but I'm not really meaning that. I don't care what you mean. I care about what the dictionary defines that term as. In the Webster's New World Dictionary, it says that G is a minced form of Jesus which is used in mild oaths. So it doesn't matter what you think, what matters is what is that word considered as by society as recorded in the dictionaries that we use to determine what words mean. Now we use it as an exclamatory interjection. If you, uh, you know, Ms. Roberts knows what I'm talking about back there, right? Grammar teacher. You know, gee, I didn't mean it. Gee, look at that, Jay, look at this. Sometimes we get a, a little brave and we add the eh, jizz. We get real close. We all do it. How about gosh? What's the, what's, what's the dictionary say about gosh? A minced form of God used as a mild oath. Webster's unabridged dictionary. There's so many others. Heavens, golly, for heaven's sakes, gracious, my Lord. All of these things, mild oaths, using euphemisms for God's name or holy things or holy concepts. And of course, the number one, a trillion times a day uttered, oh my. We can finish the rest, right? We even, we even have a contraction for it, OMG that we put in our emails and so on. Are we trying to do bad? No, we're not trying to do bad. I'm not trying to go out of my way to find things to make people feel guilty. I'm guilty of the same things. I'm just telling you, this is, this is what, what comes out of our mouths. This is what these things mean. I'm just letting you know what it means. So we may see this as being you know, extreme. However, as Christians, our conduct and our speech should be far above the standards of the world. I mean, how else will our light shine brightly if we use the exact same language that the world uses? <laughs> Another way to produce fresh water just avoid temptation. Like anything else, in order to produce good speech, we need to avoid people in situations that lead us into participating in dirty jokes or gossip or bad language. If we find ourselves in this situation, it requires true courage and conviction, as well as self-discipline, to change the course of the conversation that's going the wrong way. Have you never been in that situation, you say something, somebody else says something, it's really funny, it goes another step further and you're saying, whoa, and you find yourself saying, okay, okay, that's enough, you know, let's not go any further, right? because I think this is just going to get out of hand here. It's unseemly. You know, people in the world have no conviction about God. They think they're doing you a favor when instead of just saying GD, it, they, they say, oh gosh darn, because you know, you're a Christian and I'm, you know, I'm preserving you. Uh, cursing is cursing. God knows when His name's being used. <laughs> of course, another way also is you know, to, to get a handle on this stuff. Learn to apologize. Many may hear this and say, well, nobody's going to tell me how to talk or he's going too far, so on and so forth. But, we can't produce pure, clean, fresh water unless we understand and acknowledge that maybe we're wrong. And maybe some of us in here have been using this kind of language for years. 
just not thinking that it was wrong. We, we need to learn to say, not to me. We need to learn to say, God, Lord, I, I'm sorry for my language. I didn't want to offend you. I didn't want to take your name in vain, but maybe it seems that I've been a, a little too influenced by the world. Maybe I need to, you know, somebody asked me, or uh, Lise and I were talking, what are you preaching Sunday? And I told her what I'm preaching Sunday. And we have uh, this kind of short, you know, a short form to understand each other. And I said to her, yeah, this Sunday sermon, I'm tightening the bolts. She understands what that means. A tightening of the bolts sermon is a sermon that's got nothing really new in it. It's just tightening the bolts of our Christianity because as we're rolling along, we're hearing a clatter. So when even in the church house, I hear people say, oh my God, and oh gee, and da da da, you know, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to tighten these bolts here a little bit here. This is, this is the ship of the Lord here. So learning to apologize to God and others is the first step in gaining self-control. I have had to apologize to my children and say to them, what daddy just said is wrong. It's wrong. And I'm sorry that you had to hear daddy say that. And the reason I said it is because I lost my temper and that was wrong too. And daddy's going to make an effort to do better. Sometimes we just have to you know, tell it like it is on, on ourselves. And then perhaps one more thing, you know, how do we get a hold of this? I would encourage you to fly with the eagles. You know, if you want to fly like an eagle, you can't hang around with the chickens, right? We need to develop friendships and habits that create a building atmosphere. Don't hang around with people who spend all their time complaining, swearing, gossiping, griping, and whining, because you know what's going to happen. Find those people who have pure water coming from their fountains and learn from them and drink from them. So let me just kind of summarize a little bit here and the lesson will be yours. Number one, swearing is the use of coarse language and also the use of sacred names or sacred concepts and euphemisms and using those things in our everyday communications. In other words, we bring down the value and the holiness of God by trading on His name and trading on His ideas in a common way. Number two, people swear for various reasons, but usually because of frustration or lack of self-control, low self-esteem, ignorance, immaturity, a lot of reasons why people do that. And the Bible, number three, teaches us that A, what comes out of our mouths is an indication of what is in our hearts. And B, that one way to purify our hearts is to guard carefully what comes out of our mouths because we will be judged for this. I love Psalm 141 verse three. If you want to memorize a verse, this is a good one to memorize. The psalmist said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I read it again. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Psalm 141, three. You know, the best way to avoid swearing and evil communication is to experience the joy that comes from saying what is right and what is good and having it said to us, that's what is spiritual. So the invitation is twofold tonight. Number one, of course, come and confess Christ and be baptized if you're ready to obey the gospel. That invitation is always open. And number two, I invite you and I encourage you to decide that you're going to try to do better.
That's the invitation. I'm going to try to do better in this area because this is the month of prayer and we want God to hear our prayers. And I think that God hears a little bit better the prayers that come from the fountains that are bringing forth pure water in between the prayer times. You can't be praying to God over here and then have the salty water come out and then you're praying over here. It's good if you're praying over here and then the, the, the pure water is coming out and then you're praying over here. That, that's a nice segue from one station to the other. So no need to come forward on that invitation. Make that decision in your heart. I'm going to do better. If you're a young man, a young woman, an older saint, a mature saint, doesn't matter, we're all in the same boat. I'm going to do better.